Good afternoon. Apologies for the delay. I know that was a long two minutes. Uh, let me just start with an update on Afghanistan. Uh, the Department of State is working around the clock to facilitate the swift, safe evacuation of American citizens, special immigrant visa holders, and other vulnerable Afghans. We remain committed to accelerating flights for SIVs and other vulnerable, vulnerable Afghans as quickly as possible. The safety and security of U.S. government employees and U.S. citizens overseas is our top priority as well. The Department of Defense has secured Hamid Karzai International Airport so that military and commercial flights can resume. Our staff on the ground is communicating with American citizens in Kabul who are not at the airport with instructions on when and how to get there. We have communicated to the first tranche of American citizens who have requested evacuation assistance. Our team is working hand in glove with military colleagues to help load planes safely and securely and as fast as possible. We've now completed our drawdown to the core diplomatic presence we need, and at this time, we will no longer, uh, at this time, uh, no longer need to facilitate departures for our embassy personnel. All remaining embassy staff will be assisting departures from Afghanistan, and the department is surging resources and consular affairs personnel to augment the relocation of American citizens and Afghan special immigrants, uh, special immigrants, uh, and elsewhere adding personnel to assist with P1, P2 adjudication processing. We've successfully relocated many of our locally employed staff and are in direct contact with the remainder to determine who is interested in relocation and the process for doing so. Ambassador John Bass, a seasoned career diplomat and former ambassador to Afghanistan, Turkey, and Georgia, is heading to Kabul today to lead logistics coordination and consular efforts. A career member of the Senior Foreign Service, Ambassador Bass brings decades of experience from, for, from service at seven U.S. missions overseas and in leadership positions, including uh, Executive Secretary here in Washington. Ambassador Wilson, who has remained in Kabul, will continue to lead uh, our diplomatic engagement. At the same time, there is intensive work by, by our Afghanistan task force, uh, with colleagues working 24-7 here in Washington and at posts around the world. This is a whole-of-government effort, and we will continue to respond quickly to evolving conditions. Secretary Blinken has been in constant contact with his foreign counterparts. Just today, he spoke with uh, Qatari Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mohammed Abdurrahman Al Thani, and Kuwaiti Foreign Minister Sheikh Ahmed Nasser Al Mohammed Al Sabah, uh, thanking them for assistance in facilitating the transit of U.S. citizens and Embassy Kabul personnel through Doha and Kuwait City. He has also continued to be in close and regular contact with the President uh, and the broader national security and foreign policy team. Uh, so with that, happy to take your questions. Uh, just uh, extremely briefly on uh, Ambassador Bass. Uh, so what, what exactly, he's going to oversee the evacuation? So this is, uh, in addition to uh, every... If that's what it is, that why didn't he go, you know, several days ago or last week? So this is a massive logistical undertaking. Uh, the, our presence, our diplomatic presence in Kabul, uh, this is a, a focus of theirs. Obviously, there is a lot of other important business uh, that needs to get done from uh, management uh, to engagement um, with, the, uh, uh, with Afghans. Uh, and so what uh, Ambassador Bass will be doing uh, is overseeing the logistics uh, of this uh, rather large, rather ambitious, expansive operation. He'll be using and leveraging uh, his managerial uh, expertise uh, and logistics experience uh, to uh, help Ambassador Wilson uh, and the broader Embassy Kabul right. uh, management team with this challenge. I guess, but, uh, but he's not going there like to negotiate with the Taliban. He is not. He, he is going there to work on the nuts and bolts of this, just given how uh, logistically challenging okay. this is. And then, uh, you know, I'm sure you saw um, uh, uh, Jake's uh, briefing at the, at the White House, but he, he said that you do have an agreement with the Taliban to allow safe passage uh, for uh, people to get to the airport. Um, my question is, though, if you have such an agreement for that, how, one, how long does it go for? And, and, and then two, if you have an agreement for the airport, why couldn't you have gotten an agreement for the embassy? Why just leave this very expensive, large compound empty and open for whoever wants to 
go into it. Well, uh, to your first question, we have received assurances from the Taliban that they will allow safe passage, safe passage uh, to civilians transiting uh, to the airport. Uh, let me just be very clear about this. Uh, we take it for what it is. Uh, these are the words of uh, the Taliban. Uh, we will, of course, uh, be uh, looking for one thing and one thing only, and that is follow through. Uh, it is our expectation that they allow safe passage, that they allow us uh, to conduct our operations on the Hamid Karzai International Airport compound, um, uh, and that, of course, uh, they not target uh, civilians who are making that transit uh, to the airport. I would reiterate another point here, and that is that it is not just the United States that is calling for this. Uh, it is not something that is merely enshrined uh, in international law. Uh, yesterday, I spoke about a joint statement that the United States put together uh, with 98 signatories over the course of the past day. Uh, that has, the signatories uh, have grown. Uh, there are now over 100 countries, uh, countries from Albania to Zambia. Uh, who have signed on to uh, this statement, calling on all parties to respect and facilitate the safe and orderly departure of foreign nationals and Afghans who wish to leave the country. Part and parcel of that is safe passage to the HKIA compound. There are embassies that are not evacuating, that have not left. The Chinese and the Russians are still there. They're like, you know, going about day-to-day -day business. So. This is a sovereign decision that every country will have to come to. When it comes to the United States, uh, you have heard us say before that this president has no higher priority, Secretary Blinken has no higher priority than the safety and security uh, of Americans who are serving overseas. Uh, that is why, as the situation began to uh, change rapidly, uh, late last week, we made the decision to begin relocating uh, our embassy presence uh, to the airport compound. Of course, that was accelerated. Uh, as the conditions continue to evolve uh, in the ensuing days. Myra. Um, <coughs> Ned, can I get some uh, meaty reaction from you um, on Taliban press conference? Um, I'm sure you've seen they've made a number of assurances, and the world obviously takes it with a pinch of salt. Um, Jay Sullivan spoke to it a little bit. He also said that he wanted the team to be able to talk to Taliban. What does that exactly mean? What is the U.S. plan in terms of engagement? You know, what is the bigger strategy uh, going forward in terms of recognizing them? And I want to squeeze in the second one uh, while I can. Kosovo, Albania have said they'll take in SIV applicants. North Macedonia also did. Uganda did. Um, could you uh, give us a few details about the plan here um, for these countries in terms of numbers? And what is the latest in the negotiations with Kuwait in terms of SIV applicants? Great. Uh, there's a lot there. Let me try and remember all of that and take I it I will turn. remind you. If okay, you need I'm me sure to. you will. Uh, so when it comes to our engagement with the Taliban, we made clear yesterday that even as the situation on the ground uh, began to change markedly uh, over the course of the last week, we remain engaged, remained engaged uh, with Taliban interlocutors in Doha. Uh, this is the channel that had been operative for some time uh, that we use together uh, with the international community to support uh, the intra-Afghan dialogue. Of course, through our support for the intra-Afghan dialogue, uh, we took part uh, in separate uh, discussions on a, on a regular basis. Every time uh, the special representative for, Af uh, for Afghan reconciliation was in Doha, uh, he would meet separately uh, with representatives of the Islamic Republic, that is to say, uh, the government of Afghanistan, uh, and uh, Taliban uh, representatives. Um, that has continued. Uh, that uh, continued uh, over the course of the weekend. Now, as the situation began to change, uh, of course, so, di so too did the focus of those talks. Uh, it became less uh, narrowly focused on uh, achieving a, um, a political outcome uh, and supporting that. Uh, and it became much, much more focused uh, on uh, the safety, security of uh, our people on the ground, of civilians on the ground, everything that we could be in a position to do uh, to limit any violence, uh, to limit any bloodshed uh, in Kabul. So that is the channel uh, in Doha. Uh, we have also said uh, that there has been engagement with the Taliban on the ground uh, in Kabul. Uh, this is a military-led channel. Uh, it is a channel that is 
uh, tactical that, again, is focused uh, rather squarely on issues like safe passage for civilians. That is what we are working on uh, concertedly uh, right now. It is manifestly in our interest uh, to have these open uh, channels of dialogue uh, with the Taliban. Again, uh, as, as you heard from the National Security Advisor, uh, we have received assurances. Uh, but what matters, the only thing that matters to us uh, are uh, actions and not necessarily just words. We're going to be looking through the follow we're going to be looking for the follow through. Uh, we'll be looking for the deeds. Uh, I mentioned in the context of uh, the safe passage, a statement that the United States galvanized and, and released uh, uh, about 48 hours ago, a little less than that. Uh, regarding safe passage for civilians uh, in Kabul. Uh, there's another notable document that I called your attention to yesterday, um, but is still uh, rather noteworthy in this regard, and that's the uh, statement that emanated from the UN Security Council. Uh, the unanimous statement of the UN Security Council uh, calling for uh, the immediate cessation of all hostilities and the establishment through inclusive negotiations uh, of a new government. Uh, and a new government that enshrines, that protects, uh, that upholds uh, the basic rights of all Afghans. Uh, so this is something we continue to support, uh, a political uh, resolution uh, to what we are seeing unfold. Uh, perhaps even more importantly, this is something the international community continues to support in very tangible ways. Uh, including by speaking unanimously as the Security Council, which, as you know, uh, is often not an easy feat. These are yeah, some of our... Was, this was all yesterday. That's right. What about the press conference today? Which element of it? Well, I mean, what is your reaction to it? You've heard them give a number of assurances. How are you going to form your strategy? Well, are you thinking about recognizing them? All of this is like, I get it, but you've said very similar things almost identical yesterday. Again. Any future relationship between the Taliban and the United States, or the Taliban and much of the international community for that matter, uh, which is what we saw reflected by the UN Security Council, is going to matter, is going to be predicated on deeds. Uh, words matter, words are important, words can be reassuring, words can signal, but what we are going to be looking for are deeds. We want to see the follow through. Uh, if the Taliban says, that they are going to respect the rights of their citizens, uh, we will be looking for them to uphold that statement, to make good on that statement. Uh, just as importantly, the world is going to be looking for them uh, to make good on that statement. The United States will be watching closely, uh, and the broader international community uh, will be watching closely uh, with us. Yes, Christina. Uh, on that point, uh, you said you have an agreement with them to let civilians pass checkpoints into the airport. We've heard from multiple Afghans. My colleagues are interviewing a family right now who were stopped at checkpoints by the Taliban and prevented from getting to the airport. This is not a singular case. Furthermore, President Biden yesterday said some of the Afghans who qualified for SIV status chose not to leave. When Jen Psaki just spoke, she said there was a contingent that did not take advantage and depart. That's a different thing. And what we've heard from Afghans on the ground is they didn't depart because they couldn't get to the airport. Is it my understanding that the U.S. is still not providing any transportation either to Americans or to SIVs trying to get to the airport to depart for on these planes? I, I'll tell you what we are doing. We are doing everything we possibly can, we can, possibly can in a very fluid and dynamic and challenging security environment. I understand that. To, 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 to bring to things. safety, to bring to safety uh, as many people uh, who wish uh, to do so. Uh, there are broad categories of individuals that we're prioritizing. In the first instance, uh, we uh, repatriated uh, many of our embassy staff. Ned, that's uh, not my question. My question is, are you providing any kind of transportation for people who need to get to the airport? Are you considering a safe zone around the airport to make it easier for people to access these flights if they qualify? Uh, we are doing everything we can in a challenging and dynamic security environment. Uh, we it's are a yes we, or no we question. Are, we are engaging uh, with the Taliban. We've heard these assurances of safe passage. Uh, again, their words are only worth uh, their words. We are going to be looking for follow through. Uh, we are but going to be not following through is what I'm telling you. We are, we are watching very closely, Christina. This is a fluid situation. Uh, I, as I, uh, my colleague mentioned, we notified the first uh, tranche 
of American citizens in uh, Afghanistan yesterday who had, uh, well, overnight, I should say, who had uh, expressed an interest uh, in being repatriated to the United States. Uh, those, uh, many of those individuals um, arrived uh, at the airport. Uh, many of them have been repatriated. U.S. military flights today. But two uh, of them are telling us right now they can't get to the airport and they've I, gone back home. I, so I, like, I can't. I can't. I can't is. speak to individual cases. Uh, what What I can speak to is what we are seeking to do. Uh, we are doing everything within our power uh, to affect a passage, uh, affect a corridor of safe passage uh, for civilians. Of course, that includes American citizens uh, who are seeking to make their way to Hkaya uh, for repatriation, safe passage for other uh, civilians, uh, whether those are uh, Afghans who have been referred for P1, for P2, uh, for the SIB program, for our locally engaged uh, staff at the embassy. Uh, we are going to continue to do all we can. Uh, this is a dynamic, it's a fluid security environment. If we're, go if we're in a position to do more, I can guarantee you we will do as much as we can. Uh, the that's limiting not something you can do at the moment. At the moment, uh, at the moment, we are doing everything we can uh, to allow civilians to be able to transit uh, to the airport. Uh, the, our message remains for American citizens and for others who have expressed interest uh, in relocation out of Afghanistan. Shelter in place until and unless you receive a communication from the U.S. Embassy. Uh, as I said, uh, we notified the first tranche of American citizens overnight who had expressed interest uh, in being repatriated. In those messages, uh, we provide specific information about precisely where they should go on the airport compound, and it tells them precisely when to go. This is, again, a challenging security environment, so unless and until individuals are instructed by the U.S. Embassy uh, to make their way to the HKIA compound, we are asking them to remain in place. Right, but these are people who have been instructed and they can't get there. So what is your advice to the Americans who have been notified, they have the email from you, they have the instructions, they can't get there, they went back home, they're hiding in their apartments? We, we tell them in our, in our communications that their safety needs to be their top priority. Uh, if they feel that it is unsafe for them to make their way to the airport, they should not seek to do so. We will continue uh, to do all we can uh, to, um, uh, and we will continue to be in touch with them, uh, I should say, uh, to provide clear guidance uh, about when and how uh, they should make their way uh, to the airport compound. Can Andrea. Can you answer the yeah. SIV question before you move on? Sorry, you what, didn't was, address the, what was the SIV question? Um, you guys are having all of these talks with Kosovo, Albania, and what is the latest with Kuwait? Um, Secretary had a phone call with the Kuwaiti Foreign Minister. So the Secretary did have a uh, phone call today, plural, uh, with uh, Kuwait, uh, with his Kuwaiti and Qatari counterparts. Uh, he took advantage of those calls to thank them uh, for uh, their um, willingness uh, to allow uh, safe transit uh, of individuals uh, who we are relocating from Afghanistan. We have had, uh, we've received in recent days, uh, even recent hours. We've heard very generous offers uh, from a number of different countries. Some of those offers have uh, been very public, um, as in the case uh, you referenced, of course, our neighbors to the north. Canada uh, has demonstrated extraordinary generosity uh, in opening their doors for individuals who wish to relocate from Afghanistan. Uh, we are in touch with a number of countries uh, who may be interested uh, in uh, hosting uh, or in some way facilitating uh, the safe passage of individuals uh, seeking to um, depart Afghanistan. Uh, we are also um, asking, uh, we are asking countries around the world uh, to step up uh, to demonstrate uh, their uh, goodwill, uh, their generosity of spirit uh, to these vulnerable Afghans uh, that the United States, uh, and I should say the Department of State, working hand in hand with the Department of Defense, is doing everything we can to relocate. Do Andrea. you have a number for Albania, Kosovo, Kuwait, or in total? I, I don't have a number to give you right now. Andrea. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what confidence do you have in the Taliban statement that women would be invited into the government and can uh, have certain freedoms but under Sharia law? Well, what does that mean to you? Well, uh, it, uh, I think what will matter is what that looks like, uh, is what that looks like 
uh, when and if we see it put into practice. Uh, throughout this process, whether it was in Doha, uh, whether it is now on the ground in Kabul, whether it is us parsing uh, Taliban's, the Taliban's public statements, uh, we have never taken them squarely at their word. Uh, we have listened to what they have had to say. Uh, we have assessed what uh, they are saying pro publicly and privately, uh, arraying that against everything else uh, we know uh, and have heard and have learned. Um, but throughout this process, we have never taken them but squarely at their word. But doesn't by definition, so, just by their words, consign women to a different category than other workers in the government or others that they are talking about. Andrea, it is a, we've heard uh, quite a bit uh, from Taliban officials over the past uh, hours and, and even several days. Uh, this is, we are, we are taking stock uh, of everything that they have said. Most importantly, we are going to be looking for how they, at how they comport themselves, uh, at the way they treat their people. Uh, at how they fulfill the obligation, the solemn obligation they have to respect uh, the basic and fundamental rights of all of their people, including half of their citizens, uh, the women and girls of Afghanistan. But I will say, it is not just the United States that is watching closely. What is even more important here is that the international community is doing that. Uh, you saw that expressed in no uncertain terms by uh, the UN Security Council. Uh, and you have seen any number of countries come forward to say that they may be able to work with the Taliban if they guarantee uh, these fundamental and basic rights of their citizens. Conversely, but conversely, and, and this is important, uh, any government that denies those rights that ignores uh, the uh, freedoms, the liberties, uh, and the basic rights uh, that every person on earth should enjoy, a government that harbors terrorists, uh, a government that um, takes hostages, uh, those are, that is not certainly uh, an entity that the United States could work well, with. And we've me, heard me, countries around the world uh, say something very similar. Well, let me, let me parse that, because you're talking about the Security Council. Uh, a member of the Security Council, China, is moving towards recognition of the Taliban already. Well, uh, look, Without I, any guarantees of human rights or any other guarantees. Uh, it just so happens that China, the People's Republic of China, is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, so I can tell you precisely uh, what they said uh, when uh, they signed on to the statement on August 16th. But what they're doing today is moving towards recognizing the Taliban. I am going to have to defer to officials in Beijing to speak to what they're doing. I can tell you precisely what they signed on to, precisely but what does what, that tell you about their intent? I, I'm, I'm not here to divine the intent of the PRC government. Uh, I am here uh, to point out precisely what they have signed their name onto. Uh, the uh, we, PRC we, government uh, signed we, off on. We've seen the resolution. Well, and and it's an important, uh, it is an important piece of paper because uh, not only uh, the uh, PRC government, uh, but other permanent uh, and other members of the Security Council uh, also signed on to it. Um, but let me just make the point on uh, the PRC uh, and other uh, governments. It is not only this UN Security Council statement. Uh, we have spoken, including in recent days, of a number of groupings of countries that have, uh, uh, over the course of months or even longer, uh, lent their uh, voices and their efforts uh, to supporting an intra-Afghan dialogue, uh, supporting a political settlement between the parties. When it comes to the PRC, uh, they are a member of the extended troika. The extended troika, uh, as recently as recent days, has spoken with uh, one voice um, about the need for a negotiated political settlement uh, through a process that is owned and led by the Afghan people. Uh, a um, forceful takeover that ignores uh, the basic and fundamental rights of those very Afghan people 
uh, would not be consistent with what we have heard from any number of countries, including uh, the PRC. But that's the situation on the ground. Well, let me ask you another question. The statement, highly unusual statement from President Bush and Laura Bush, a joint statement about the urgent need to take care of refugees, including a much larger population. They're calling for a much more expansive uh, refugee program. They say that we have a responsibility, a moral responsibility, a legal responsibility. We have the resources. Members of Congress say they passed the legislation on the defense supplemental. It's all there. And they're talking about the kind of broader refugee program that goes well beyond the categories you have identified, that is closer to what we saw after Vietnam and, and the Cuban migrations. Um, and in talking to Leon Panetta today and other former officials uh, from many administrations, those migrations deeply enriched our country with people of great intellect and vigor uh, and abilities such as the Afghans. So is the State Department going to go beyond these, these categories and according to the Bushes, cut the red tape? We have an obligation to get rid of all this bureaucratic red tape and with that supplemental and the, what Congress passed, members of Congress, many Democrats are saying that you guys are being way too uh, bureaucratic in the requirements to get the people out of there and then process them. Uh, Andrea, that is precisely what we are trying to do. Uh, our goal is to uh, bring to safety as many Afghans uh, as we possibly can for as long as we can. Uh, and we have spoken to uh, the broad uh, categories of Afghans uh, for uh, whom we are uh, going to extraordinary lengths to uh, bring them to safety. Uh, we have spoken about uh, the Afghan special immigrant uh, visa holders. We have spoken about uh, those so-called priority one um, referrals to the U.S. Refugee Assistance Program. Uh, the new category uh, for Afghans, uh, these are Afghans who have uh, helped the American people uh, over the years, who have worked closely uh, with U.S. organizations, but what about NGOs. This larger program, Ned, and mm -hmm. how do they get to Kabul? In NGOs. How do these people ever get to Kabul, no less the airport? In NGOs and media organizations uh, as well. This was a broad and new category uh, that uh, we announced uh, to resettle an even uh, larger universe. Uh, but we are also uh, working to do all we can for uh, a category of Afghans we're calling Afghans at risk. Uh, and Afghans at risk refers to uh, women, it refers to girls, to human rights defenders, journalists, uh, other civil society actors uh, who might not otherwise qualify for the SIV program, for the P1 uh, referral, or for the priority, so-called priority two uh, referral. So again, uh, we are going to extraordinary links. We uh, are um, gratified to have a partner in Congress uh, that uh, in the course of, over the course of uh, several weeks now, we have worked with, uh, especially in the context of uh, the SIV program, to cut some of that red tape. Uh, as you know, the SIV program, it is defined by statute. Uh, if memory serves, there are 14 steps uh, that were written into statute uh, that an SIV applicant would need to go, to, uh, to go through uh, before he or she could uh, be considered a special immigrant uh, and uh, be granted access to uh, the United States. Um, but let me just offer a, a, a bit more context because I think it's, I think it's important um, as to what we've done. Uh, when this administration uh, came into office, uh, and let me just take a step even further back, uh, we have spoken of the SIV program, uh, of course, in recent days, uh, in recent weeks. But this is a program that has existed for years now. Uh, the United States government, over the course of those many years, uh, has uh, welcomed more than 76,000 uh, Afghan special immigrants. That is to say, Afghans who, uh, at great personal risk to themselves or to their families, uh, has, have helped the United States government uh, over the years. Uh, in recent days alone, we have uh, brought 2,000 uh, of them to the United States. Uh, and most of them have now begun uh, their new lives through no, refugee, through, 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 but Christina, I, I promise I'll come back to you. But I, we all have questions about today. 
Okay, so if I, you guys, if my colleagues want to go, that's fine. But we, we know this history, Ned. We do. We've got limited time. And we've got a lot of questions. I, I, I will come right back to you. But, but let me just, because I think the context is not unimportant. Um, what is also true is that when we came into office, there was a large backlog of SIV applicants, uh, of SIV applicants uh, who had waited months or even longer. We have gone to extraordinarily, extraordinary lengths uh, since the earliest days of this administration uh, to shorten that back backlog, to cut some of that red tape. We have worked with Congress. Congress uh, says it's only because of their pressure that you were way behind, not you personally, but that the State Department lagged terribly on this and that they had to force this legislation. This was a backlog, Andrea, that we inherited. Uh, when we came into office in January 20th, there were, there were uh, thousands upon thousands of special immigrant applicants uh, who were in this backlog. Uh, we have been gratified to find a partner in Congress. We have worked with Congress to cut some of this bureaucratic red tape. Again, it's a 14-step process. Uh, so on top of that, uh, as the security situation began to change, of course, our embassy went on order departure on April 27th. Even with the order departure, uh, we were able to surge additional resources uh, to Kabul, uh, consular officers specifically, to take on uh, some of this backlog and to make progress. Just as we did that, we moved some of the functions that previously were being conducted in Kabul to the United States uh, so that we could have even greater um, resources dedicated uh, to that. Uh, with those steps, uh, we were able to cut many, many months off the average wait time uh, for SIV applicants. Our embassy in Kabul, I should say, did all of this under uh, stressful, intense circumstances and amidst a COVID outbreak. Uh, COVID, of course, uh, played a, 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 was a, a limiting factor uh, in terms of how much not only uh, uh, the last administration uh, was able to do uh, against this backlog, but also for us, uh, especially as COVID uh, took a particularly um, uh, severe turn uh, at our embassy in Kabul. Uh, over the course of uh, April, May, June, July, if you look at the average processing times, we shaved significant processing times uh, off of uh, each of those okay, but over uh, the of those months, applicants. You've gotten 2,000 people out. You that know that is not true. Well, you, uh, you're up that, to 2,000. You just said 2,000 was the number you said. 2,000, if you would let me finish. So on top of all that, we started an ambitious, aggressive relocation effort, Operation Allies Refuge. Uh, we have relocated 2,000 Afghan special immigrants through Operation Allies Refuge. Uh, many more, hundreds more special immigrants uh, were uh, uh, traveled to the United States before Operation Allies Refuge okay, began. Correct. So since Allies Refuge, you've gotten 2,000 people out. 2,000. You now have less than 14 days to get how many? 40,000, 60,000 with a limited staff at a, a tiny embassy that you're operating out of the airport. I'm not impugning the, the difficulties for the State Department employees. I am sure they're working hard. I'm sure they're trying their best. But do you really think logistically it is possible to make any kind of a dent in that and get those people out? Furthermore, what is the order for who is coming out of the airport? Is it, you said it's not embassy staff anymore. So it is American citizens, then SIVs, then refugees. Who is coming out in what order? And if I'm a woman or a girl and I show up at the airport, does that qualify me as a P2, as a person of special consideration? Uh, so uh, a couple things. Uh, we are going to do, and we are doing, as much as we can for as long as we can uh, to relocate, uh, to bring to safety, whether that is to the United States or elsewhere, uh, vulnerable Afghans, whether they are SIV applicants, uh, whether they have refugee status, uh, whether uh, they fall into other vulnerable categories. You've heard from DOD that the Department of Defense has uh, been in a position to relocate tremendous lift capacity. Uh, so now that the airport is under the control of the Department of Defense, uh, not only U.S. military aircraft have been able to land and take off, but also charter aircraft. Uh, it is also uh, a goal of the United States and our international partners uh, to see to it that the commercial flights are able to take off and land. Uh, this is something that we are working on very closely uh, with our uh, partners, with Afghans on the ground. Uh, the the uh, uh, reinitiation of commercial operations uh, will add a tremendous, would add tremendous capacity uh, to those seeking to uh, relocate from 
uh, Afghanistan. In terms of uh, prioritization, uh, of course, uh, our first priority, our, um, uh, our, our first responsibility is always going to be uh, to the American people. Uh, so uh, we've spoken of our uh, relocation, repatriation of our direct hire staff. That has uh, now completed for the time being. Uh, I told you uh, today that we have notified the first tranche of private American citizens who have expressed an interest in being repatriated to the United States. Uh, so uh, those Americans, uh, we're, we're not offering numbers, but it's the first tranche, and I expect uh, uh, several tranches uh, of Americans and their families, uh, uh, giving them explicit instructions about where and when to go. Um, and we are going to do as much as we can for as long as we can uh, for refugees or other vulnerable Afghans who may be interested in relocation. Nick. Staff that are still in Kabul, is it your expectation that they will remain in Kabul indefinitely? And would they potentially return to the U.S. Embassy, or would that constitute recognition of whatever government comes next? I mean, are you thinking that they will leave uh, once all these priority groups have been taken care of? Right now, Nick, we're focused on the mission at hand. Uh, and the mission at hand is precisely what I was describing to Christina. Um, that is an effort to relocate, uh, in some cases repatriate to the United States, in other cases to relocate to third countries, uh, as many individuals uh, as we can uh, over as much time as we might have. Uh, right now, uh, we are thinking about this in terms of uh, August 31st. Uh, if okay. it is uh, safe and responsible uh, for us to um, potentially stay longer. That is something that we may be able to look at. Stay longer, uh, meaning the entire the diplomatic presence that's on the ground now. I'm sorry, say that again. Diplomatic presence that's on the ground now. You're referring to them potentially staying longer? Uh, look, we are the first, our first responsibility has to be to the safety and security sure. uh, of our uh, team on the ground. Uh, that is precisely why. Uh, our embassy went on order departure on April 27th. It's precisely why we conducted successive uh, drawdowns of the embassy team uh, after April right. 27th. It's precisely why uh, right. last Thursday we began the relocation uh, to the Hamid Karzai International Airport uh, and why we accelerated uh, repatriations of our embassy staff uh, after that. We are right. going to do as much as we can for as long as we can uh, for uh, vulnerable Afghans. Okay, so then on Doha, just given what you said earlier about priorities shifting from, you know, negotiations with the Taliban to, uh, you know, the, the other priority of, of reducing bloodshed, I mean, given that senior Taliban leaders are now returning to the country, um, it, it, is it your expectation that Doha is essentially dead and it's time to shift those conversations to some other format? Um, I mean, what, what more can be gained out of Doha if senior Taliban leadership are now back in the country and apparently or seemingly would have no incentive to negotiate power sharing uh, when they basically control the entire country? Well, we believe that uh, continued dialogue has the potential to be constructive. As I said yesterday, Dialogue to date uh, has had constructive elements. Uh, we have heard things uh, that were welcome. Uh, we are going to be looking to that follow through. Uh, okay. So not the entire um, political office, the entire political office has not relocated uh, to Kandahar or other parts of Afghanistan just yet. Uh, there are still Taliban representatives uh, on the ground uh, in Doha. Uh, but you are right uh, that in many ways the center of gravity is shifting uh, from Doha to uh, Afghanistan. We will uh, continue to adjust. Uh, as I said before, we adjusted the focus uh, of our dialogue uh, as the conditions on the ground began to uh, change rapidly uh, in, in recent days, and we'll continue okay. to do that going forward. Thanks. And then one last one from me, uh, just following up on your issue of uh, uh, mention of vulnerable groups and, and women being included in, in vulnerable groups. Would uh, women in, in Afghanistan automatically qualify for P2 status given their gender and the threats that the Taliban have made uh, or the way that they've treated women in the past? So there are really two different things. Um, there is a so-called uh, priority to referral status for uh, those who are referred to the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Right. Uh, and that is uh, defined uh, in a set of categories. 
um, uh, and to be uh, to, to paraphrase, it's individuals uh, who have worked for U.S.-based NGOs, individuals who have worked for U.S.-based media organizations. Uh, I should say on that score, I think as many of you know, we expanded the definition of employment uh, to uh, see to it that stringers and contractors and those working on assignment uh, can also qualify for uh, the P2 program. But then, Nick, there is a separate category. Uh, of, of so-called vulnerable Afghans. These are Afghans who, uh, because of the course of their work, uh, their advocacy, uh, their um, name recognition, uh, what they have done over the years uh, to stand up for the rights of their uh, fellow Afghans, uh, who may be especially vulnerable. That's what we mean what about, to refer to. What about their gender? Vulnerable Af I'm sorry? What about their gender? I mean, is that... Uh, well, in many cases, uh, they have uh, stood up and been forceful advocates for their fellow uh, Afghan women and girls. But what's yeah. the process for that? Do, do people need a referral of some kind at this point? You know, and, and if you're committed to safely evacuating them, why have them still go through this sort of paperwork in order to get out of the, the country? Uh, so when it comes to uh, when it comes to referrals. Uh, there are, uh, uh, we are and will be uh, looking to um, uh, relocate uh, as many Afghans who may fall into the P1 uh, and P2 categories as quickly as we can. Uh, we are going to continue sending uh, very specific communications uh, to American citizens, uh, and we will provide guidance uh, to others uh, who may fall into uh, these other categories uh, about uh, when and how uh, they should uh, seek to leave the country. In some cases, uh, that may be through uh, the U.S. military. In some cases, there may be charter operations. I can tell you that there are a number of uh, American NGOs, private organizations that are seeking to charter flights uh, to um, uh, bring to the United States or bring elsewhere um, individuals with whom they have worked uh, on the ground uh, over the course of uh, of many years. So yes, the United States government is, uh, has mounted this uh, ambitious, large operation uh, to bring to safety as many Afghans as we can uh, for as long as we possibly can. Uh, but we have also been working very closely, including uh, many people here at the State Department, working very closely uh, with private American organizations, with NGOs, uh, who are also engaged in an effort, including in some cases with uh, potential charter options. Yes? If, if the U.S. was unable to foresee the speed of the fall of Kabul, even with the Taliban down the road, um, when it comes to spotting an emerging threat from al-Qaeda, for example, <laughs> Shouldn't your allies now expect substantially less from the U.S. government? We talked about this uh, some yesterday, uh, but it, it is especially important to us. Um, uh, in some ways, uh, it, uh, it, is, it is especially important to us uh, because it has a direct bearing on our top priority, and that is the safety and security uh, of the American people. Uh, we know a couple things to be true. Uh, over the course of the past 20 years, terrorist groups that uh, have been active in Afghanistan, principally al-Qaeda, uh, the group that the United States military uh, went into Afghanistan in October of 2001 uh, to pursue, has been degraded and decimated. Uh, that is absolutely true. Uh, the terrorist threats that have emanated from Afghanistan in recent years uh, have certainly not been on the scale uh, of what we saw pre-9-11 or in the years post-9-11. And there is there's a couple of reasons for that, but the overriding reason for that uh, is the fact that uh, our military uh, and our broader uh, U.S. government partners conducted uh, their mission to degrade and to decimate uh, that al-Qaeda network there extraordinarily effectively. Uh, they accomplished the goal that successive American presidents set out for them. Uh, it is also true that when our uh, service members, special forces, um, uh, intelligence agencies uh, first went into Afghanistan uh, in the early part of uh, this millennium, uh, they were operating with uh, a set of tools that were far less effective uh, than what the U.S. government can muster now. Uh, over the course of the past 20 years, technologies, strategies, tactics uh, have been honed, 
have been refined, and we've seen the results of those in the degraded state. And where were state. those tactics and techniques last week as Kabul fell? You're, these are two separate things you're talking about. Um, let me just talk about the, 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 the terrorist threat, uh, and then I'll go to uh, what you're referring to. Um, when it comes to the terrorist threat, uh, we have heard from our uh, intelligence community uh, that uh, we have the capacity uh, to uh, observe and to respond decisively uh, if we see a threat emerge uh, in Afghanistan uh, that poses a threat to the United States. What if you don't see it because you're not there? You're, you're uh, Andrea, are gone. Andrea, Andrea, there are many places where we don't have American forces on the ground where we can and where we have responded decisively uh, to terrorist threats that have emerged. Uh, Yemen is one example. Uh, parts of Syria is another example. I could give you a litany of countries where we don't have service members, where we have uh, responded effectively you and decisively. You do have service members in Syria. Uh, in parts of Syria, I said, uh, I, uh, where we have responded effectively and decisively. Now, what you're referring to uh, is something entirely different. Uh, what you are referring to is the fact that uh, we were taken by surprise. Uh, it is undeniable that we were surprised at the pace by which uh, the Taliban uh, uh, were able to uh, um, uh, uh, pursue their territorial advances uh, and the speed with which they encroached on Kabul. But the decisive factor there was the way in which the Afghan National Security Forces, uh, a force that on paper far outmatched what the Taliban had to muster uh, by at least three to one, 300,000 trained, well-equipped uh, Afghan forces that had an air force, that had heavy equipment, that had special forces, uh, that had um, received uh, technology from the U.S. government, uh, there was not the capacity uh, or the will. Uh, they could not find the capacity or the will uh, to take on uh, the Taliban advance. On top of that, there was the political question uh, that was also unexpected. Um, uh, as you know, uh, President Ghani and some of uh, his uh, colleagues left the country. They left the country quite suddenly. Uh, with that, with those two elements converging, uh, it is absolutely true uh, that we were surprised at the speed at which uh, the Taliban uh, were able to um, uh, approach Kabul. But that, but that has, but that has nothing to do uh, with the ability that uh, we have and that we will retain. Uh, to take on uh, terrorist threats uh, that may uh, seek to threaten the United States. The Taliban today said they will not harbor foreign fighters to launch terrorist attacks abroad. Do you believe them? Again, uh, we are going to listen to their words. What we will be looking for are their actions. Uh, it's their deeds that matter to us, uh, especially on a matter of, of uh, utmost importance like this. Connor? Non-Afghan question? Go ahead. But, yeah, yeah, can yeah, I get yeah, a non-Afghan yeah. question? Well, there is relative comment in Kabul. There are reports of atrocities in other cities that the Taliban hold. When, before, before the fall of Kabul, the embassy was corroborating some of those reports. Do you have anything to say about that? Do you have any confirmation of whether or not some of these atrocities have been committed, extrajudicial killings, um, harassment of women, things like that? Uh, we are going to be watching very closely. Um, right now, as we've said, this is a fluid situation. We, of course, had seen, um, uh, and the world had seen, uh, atrocities uh, occur uh, over the course of uh, weeks and months uh, as the Taliban's uh, campaign progressed. Uh, over the past 72 hours, uh, the conditions on the ground have, have changed dramatically. Uh, we are going to be watching uh, very closely for uh, a couple reasons. Uh, number one, uh, we are going to be working uh, with the international community to do all we can to provide humanitarian assistance, to provide support uh, to uh, vulnerable Afghans, uh, Afghans who may be at risk going forward uh, from the Taliban. Now, of course, they claim otherwise, but uh, we are going to be poised 
to work with the international community to pull every lever we can uh, to use every tool at our disposal with the international community uh, to provide support and assistance. Uh, but two, there's the question of what comes next. Uh, the question not only of what the United States uh, does vis-a-vis -vis a future Afghan government, uh, but what the international community does. Uh, and so this is another reason why we're watching very closely. We have made very clear our expectations uh, of any government with which we could be expected to work in Kabul. Uh, if that government doesn't respect uh, the basic rights of its own citizens, including the rights uh, of its uh, women and girls, that is not a government uh, that we would be expected to work with. Importantly, it's not a government that the rest of the world, or at least much of the international community, would be expected to work with. And, and finally, but there, there's, there's a tangible element to this, uh, and it's a, it's a point that is quite important um, uh, because it has practical implications. Uh, it is more than a matter of political recognition uh, or diplomatic connectivity. It is a matter of, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, it's an existential question. It has the potential to be an existential question for any government. Uh, we know that the government that had existed uh, in Kabul over the past 20 years could not have uh, endured were it not for the support of the United States, the largest bilateral donor, were it not for the support of the United Nations, were it not for the support of the international community. The same uh, could well be true of what comes next. Uh, it is a question of carrots. We certainly have uh, carrots in terms of the assistance that uh, any future government in Afghanistan might be expected to need, uh, but also uh, the sources of leverage that we've talked about. Uh, the fact that working with our partners in the international community, working with uh, the UN, uh, there are significant costs uh, that uh, collectively we would be able to impose on any government that does not respect the basic rights of its people, and that's something we're prepared to do. What happened to the idea that any government imposed by the barrel of a gun is what mattered? We have, we have always said that um, we, like our partners in the international community, uh, supported a political settlement. Uh, we believe, uh, present tense, we believe that a political settlement uh, stands the best chance of uh, offering protection, offering inclusion for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, we continue to believe that. Uh, if you take a look at what the members of the UN Security Council said, they continue to uh, believe that. But, but uh, this group has seized power by force now, and, and they, are not, they don't care about those statements of, of, of what you believe. This is a terrorist organization that now has control of the country, and you're saying that their future behavior is what you'll weigh. How does, how does what has happened for the last week and a half months not matter more. It, it, all of this absolutely matters. All of this absolutely matters. And what we're saying now uh, will matter. It will matter to any future government. Not so much because the United States is saying it, but because uh, as you've seen over the past couple days, the international community, a broad swath of the international community, the countries uh, that are in many ways will be most important, uh, Afghanistan's neighbors, uh, important stakeholders, in the region, uh, some of the most generous countries on the face of the earth, the countries that have allowed, had allowed uh, the Afghan government to endure uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, when we're speaking with one voice and we're talking about uh, assistance, potential assistance, and we're talking uh, conversely uh, about the tools, uh, the implications, the sources of leverage that we are prepared to wield against any government that does not respect the basic rights of its citizens, uh, those are more than words. Those have practical consequences. Matt? There's, there's an assumption in the question that you answered it positively. I just want to make sure that it's correct. Do you believe that the Taliban has taken power by force at the, the, at the barrel of a gun? There, 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 has, not been, they, uh, there has not been a formal uh, transfer of power. Uh, right. Of course, it's a, it's a fluid dynamic. Uh, there, are, there are ongoing discussions uh, between Afghan leaders following... Uh, so the, so, but but, but, but the, question, the question was, you, you said you would never recognize or deal with a government that had seized power by mm -hmm. at the barrel of a gun. You're not prepared to make that 
statement yet that they that the, that the Taliban has seized power at the barrel of gun, right? We are taking stock of what right. has transpired. Right. There continues to be dialogue between right. Afghans, between but representatives you, but, of the Taliban and representatives right. of but the Islamic Republic. That this, that you say that also that the center of gravity has shifted from mm -hmm. Doha to Afghanistan. Right. Isn't it clear from what's happened over the past couple of months that the center of gravity was always in Afghanistan and never in Doha, and it was a, basically a waste of time? I, I'm not. Uh, in Doha? We, uh, look, we are, we, are, we are not prepared to say that. Uh, we're not prepared to say that for. Because what happened in Doha has accomplished a great deal? What, I mean, I'm Matt, when you sarcastic, I just want to know. I mean, do you, do you think that anything that has been achieved in Doha since February twenty twenty is actually accomplished? The the intra Afghan dialogue, the discussions between the Afghans in this case, the Taliban uh, and the representatives of the Islamic Republic, those are ongoing. Uh, it matters very little whether that happens in Doha, whether that happens in Kandahar, whether that happens in Kabul. All along, our goal has not been to be prescriptive. Uh, our goal has not to been to forge a consensus, to create a consensus. Our goal has been to support uh, that intra-Afghan dialogue, and it's an intra-Afghan dialogue that remains ongoing. Can, can I ask, my, I just want, did you get a, an answer to my question about Bahrain from the other week? And if you don't have it right there, I can get it later from you. But then secondly, the secretary let, or you put out a statement um, Semi late last night about the secretary. Uh, well, it was a comment from the secretary about the uh, lo uh, legislation of Poland, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if anything has changed since then because the Israelis seem to have a stronger reaction um, than you did, at least on the restitution part. And I'm wondering and, and suggesting that the U.S. and Israel, that they and the U.S. would be taking some kind of joint action. So, is there anything? new on that since the statement from last night? Well, you're right. We did issue uh, a, quite a strong <coughs> statement from uh, Secretary Blinken. Uh, what he made clear is that we are deeply disappointed uh, by amendments to the Code of Administrative Procedure uh, that restrict compensation for property wrongfully confiscated uh, during Poland's communist era. Uh, we have said all along that Poland is an important NATO ally. Uh, the alliance we have with Poland, the alliance we share uh, with Poland and our other uh, NATO allies is based on, among other things, mutual commitments to uh, democratic values and, and to prosperity. And so with that in mind, uh, the secretary uh, and the broader uh, department, um, we have urged the government of Poland to demonstrate its commitment uh, to these very shared principle, uh, these very shared principles, um, and to make good on that, to make good on that indeed. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Can you, if you do have something on Bahrain, can someone get it to me? Yep. Thanks. Um, hey, I, I'm the, the people going to the airport.